Okay, so the second thing we're talking about today is we are going to be just talking about your computer science careers right now. And so uh, to do your, your computer science, your CSI career. Okay. And uh, that's a little bit bigger. So the course sequence for computer science at our college is CSI 1, which is optional. It's like the intro to the intro computer science. There's CSI 40, which is like intro. There's CSI 41, which is data structures. Data structures. CSI 1 is like uh, intro to intro, and it's also uh, critical thinking. Fallacies, argumentation, things like that. It's a lot of fun for me to teach. Data structures is where you guys are at right now. Uh, CSI 26 is discrete math. Uh, discrete math, discrete here meaning like uh, integers, right? So it doesn't mean quiet or secretive math. It means that uh, all the math is basically involving integers. It's the math of computer science. And there's a lot of different topics all mixed together in discrete math. We do graph theory, we do uh, probability and statistics, we do encryption, uh, RSA encryption, things like that. And uh, uh, we do uh, Markov chaining, which is uh, absolutely hilarious. Uh, pull that up for a second. Uh, do that. All right. On whiskey. Too much is just enough. Yeah. Yesterday was St. Patrick's Day, so. <laughs> Let's see. Bridges Markov. Don't reference. Okay. So, uh, what. What this does is, uh, this is a sample CSI 26 assignment. So every time it reads a word, it keeps track of kind of the word before it and the word that comes after it. And it learns, probabilistically speaking, which words are more likely to come after other words. So the is followed by hours here. And the is followed by sun here. And the is followed by air here. And so it counts how many times the word air follows the, sun follows the, you know, things like that. And so when you feed that in to, uh, let's, I don't know less, uh, pink Floyd, print graph and exit. So you can see that N is followed by the 43 times. It's followed by 1961 one time. Uh, it's followed by your three times. The is followed by air, by sun six times, sunshine one time, high finality one time, things like that. And so after it learns the frequency of the word patterns, then, <laughs> yeah, Megan has her uh, Hogwarts uh, Markov chaining thing here. Neville, we're playing Slytherin. He ate their fifth year. <laughs> the next day before, you know, Cornelius, the Voldemort back into his skull. It's amazing. Yeah. So you can use it to generate uh, random words. And so what you can do is, uh, you know, I count how many times each word starts a sentence. And so we randomly pick words to start sentences based on how likely they are to start a sentence. So let me just pick, like, pick something, like leave. Leave starts a sentence once again. So if we start a sentence with leave, and then we've got uh, 13 words that followed it, Four of the time it was them, four of the times it was me, leave me. Uh, one of the times, leave behind. And so what we do is we roll a number from 1 to 13 and pick. If we roll a 1, we, we'll, we will print to the screen, leave but. And if we roll a 2, 3, 4, or 5, we'll say, leave me. And then we search for me, search for me. Then if we print leave me, then we get to here and we roll a 46-sided die, essentially. And if we get a three, we will print that, leave me that. And then we get to that over here. Then we roll a 37 sided die, leave me that feeling, you know, something like that. And then maybe, maybe that's the end of the sentence because, uh, you know, it also records how often a word ends a sentence as well. So it might say, leave me that feeling. And then that would be a sample Pink Floyd, never before seen Pink Floyd, uh, Lyric. So we'll generate, uh, I don't know, 20 random sentences. We'll not do it too high. 
if the basic facts, but I think it's a glimpse. The bulls are you, fritter, and if their mother do. Take care of the final solution. I'm waiting to send you, see you slight. I've got an album. Am, I am, I trust the car. Caviar, four star. How green it was on you. Stand still, unsatisfied. Uh, we can also do this with Wu-Tang lyrics. Uh, we can do this with Alex Jones, uh, the famous conspiracy theory person. So we do Alex Jones and make some new Alex Jones uh, words. Uh, let's see. Look at these guys, people. I'm going to kill you. Commit evil system. Out of this crap in your job soon as she falls down. I live in Austin. The pedophile government and its biggest mass murder after invasion forced me. Eddie Bravo, man to Muhammad. I'm sitting in the hotel all the time. So you're going to imagine people that James was a slime girl. More blood of me. I'm serious. I'm not seeing this. Is this, is, this is all one sentence. Right there. <laughs> it is modern language model AI. Just way more primitive. Exactly. So it is uh, kind of similar to how ChatGPT and things like that work, except without any of the uh, more intelligent stuff on top of it. Yep. So that's something that you can uh, look forward to in CSI 26 discrete math. Uh, like I said, it's a grab bag of topics that computer science people need. Uh, the only other math that is really necessary, in my opinion, is math six, in other words, uh, linear algebra. I think that every computer science major needs to take linear algebra. It's like algebra, but more so. So instead of there being like X and Y, there's like X1 and X2 and X3 all the way up to X100. <laughs> You've got 100 variables instead of two. Uh, it is extremely useful. Uh, most math classes past trig are not that commonly used in computer science. Uh, with there being giant caveats, like if you're working in... Um, financial technologies, if you're working in engineering, yeah, you got to know calculus, you got to know discrete, or not discrete, uh, differential equations. So like for calculus and differential equations, I like to say like 20% of the time, it comes up 100% of the time. The other 80% of the time, it's just not necessary. So linear algebra though comes up all the time and discrete math comes up all the time. So uh, I, I wasn't math 17, okay, sorry. There you go. It's eight. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know. It's 11 points higher than math six, whatever. Okay, so now. So math 17 is uh, linear algebra. Highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. Uh, even if you don't have to take it, I would take it. It's, it's easier than calculus. Like, it's not harder. Like, I don't understand why it's at the end of the, the math sequence. Like, it's actually pretty easy and straightforward. Um, but, yeah, way easier than differential equations, way easier than calc. So... You know, I would take it. And then finally, we've got CSI 45, and this is uh, assembly plus architecture plus projects. So if you guys want to see the projects uh, that my students in 45 are making right now, uh, they are presenting them tomorrow at 11 o'clock, maybe 1030, something like that, in uh, AC1114 on campus. So if you want to see what they're working on, they're making carnival games right now. So uh, one, of the, one of the groups was in there in the 12 o'clock section. They're making Plinko, where you drop a disc down and it bounces around and it has a sensor that detects it. It goes in the cup and it gives you points and things like that. So it's pretty cool. Pretty neat. So the projects are kind of my favorite part of all of computer science because really getting to see students like work with their hands, which is crazy because computer science people don't understand the real world and touching things and hammering and stuff like that. Like we just don't do that. Soldering, like what is that? So seeing students actually like building things that are actually real and tangible in the real world and interacting with the real world is really cool. Uh, we do art projects sometimes. Um, we do uh, sentry guns every year that shoot ping pong balls and things like that. Uh, let me, uh, uh, that screeching is horrible. Uh, for whatever reason, my cell phone records a shriek, uh, whenever it's in the, the classroom. And so this is a, um, uh, um, Mandrake from, um, Harry Potter. 
So I've, I've muted this. You can't hear the explanation. But basically, uh, this is... Uh, I'm, do you remember that in Harry Potter, you like pull down, they shriek and things like that? Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe that high-pitched shrieking sound is appropriate. But that's just the sound that my, my mic picks up when it's in the classroom. It doesn't pick it up anywhere else. So it has to be the undying souls of the damned or something like that in there. I don't know. Anyway, so when you spray water on it here, you can see the mandrake makes a little happy face here. And then if we turn this on, it starts screaming. So, uh, that yeah, I've been shrieking, <laughs> right? Yeah, I can't, I can't deal with it. So anyway, so the, uh, the, ma the mandrake will smile when you spray water on it. When you water it, it gives a little happy face. And, uh, and then when you pull it out, it screams. And so it's a, a moisture sensor and a tilt sensor, basically with a Raspberry Pi controlling. It's very simple art installation. But you know what? If you go to the WB um, Studios tour in uh, Hollywood, uh, they have mandrakes. I mean, they look, you know, they look more professional than the cardboard here, but it's essentially the same thing. You grab them and pull them out, and it screams, and that's it. And so you're literally making things. Here, it's actually better than the, the ones at the WB Studios because, like, you can water them, and it reacts to being watered. Whereas at the WB, I think all they do is scream when you pull it out. They might have... They might have something else, but I think they just scream when you pull them out, and that's it. So these projects are like pretty, pretty fun. Um, let's see. Yeah, anyway, so we do uh, we do projects, sentry guns, carnival games, um, all sorts of stuff where you're actually soldering and wiring and stuff like that. It's it's a heck of a lot of fun. Um, you know, and wear PCs. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We only the best. I like how you tried to cast light us. The shrieking was real. I couldn't hear. Like I don't hear it. Like I didn't watch my own videos. So I don't. I don't know. I just posted them. And Nico's like, "What's that shrieking?" I'm like, "I don't hear shrieking." You know, because like I'm like for whatever reason, my cell phone picks up shrieking that nobody can hear in that room. And if I take and like when I walk my cell phone around, it's coming from some point in the room. Like, it gets quieter when I go to the back corner of the room. And when I walk with my cell phone closer, it gets louder. So there is something in that room emitting a hypersonic shriek 24-7 that only my cell phone can hear. So, Ghosts of the Damned, uh, we did have a bird die in there, you know, uh, a year or so ago. It got stuck in the, it got stuck in the um, air vent and it, was, and it died while staring at the screen. So it died while being exposed to, you know, weeks of computer science knowledge. Maybe it's it's ghost. I don't know. Or maybe my cell phone's just broken. Could be any of those things. So haunted. I know. But like when I record here at my house, there's no screaming. It's just at school. So I don't know. All right. Anyway, so architecture is understanding what goes on inside of your computer. So, you know, you, you guys have all heard of like RAM and CPU and hard drives and things like that. That's a very middle school level of architecture. We're actually learning uh, what goes into a CPU. So you, you'd be able to like look at the block diagram of a CPU and be like, oh, that's how that works. And like actually be like, oh, it's got 128K of level one cache and all that stuff makes sense to you. And the reason why that matters, even if you're just a software engineer, the reason why architecture matters is because you can write code that is friendly to your hardware, or you can write code that is unfriendly to your hardware. And if it's unfriendly, you're gonna be wasting a lot of time. Like your code could run like 10 times slower and you would have no idea why, unless you understood the architecture. And if you understood the architecture, you're like, oh, let me rewrite my code to be friendlier to the cache system on my computer. And then all of a sudden your code's running faster, even though, you know, from a correctness standpoint, there's no difference. Like, you know, if you, if you go across the rows of a matrix tatted up or go down the columns tatted up, it makes no difference from a correctness standpoint. Your code runs in order of magnitude when you go this way instead of this way. You're like, Damn. You know, and if you've never taken architecture, that just doesn't make any sense to you. Or like, why is a deck slower than a vector? Why is a linked list slower than a deck? You know, they're all order in, you know, if you want to print out all the elements in a vector, print out all the elements in a deck, print out all the elements in a linked list, they're all order in, you're printing everything out. But, Vector's a lot faster. 
And it, that only makes sense after you take an architecture because vectors are more cash local. They, they fit better into cash, whereas linked lists can oftentimes be in different spots in memory. And so you keep getting cache misses, which slow down the system. Finally, uh, we learn ARM32 assembly. I'm thinking about moving to ARM64 um, assembly. Uh, I haven't decided yet. Um, it's, it's one of those things that I'm considering. ARM32 assembly is really nice. It's I've learned five different assembly languages over the years, and ARM32 is my favorite. It, there's really, there's like eight commands you guys need to know to do all the programs in the class. There's like add, which adds two numbers, sub, which subtracts two numbers, mul, which multiplies two numbers. What do you guys think's next? Now there's no division. Uh, there's branch, there's compare, uh, there's load, there's store. Probably forgetting something. Yeah, basically. Repeated subtraction. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. But that's basically it. Like, you know, add two numbers. Like, that's, like, it's it's literally actually not that hard. Uh, it, it could be annoying to, like, put together a large program. Like, you know, I've seen people put together, like, a chess program in assembly, and I'm like, it's too much. But what's really cool about it is that you actually learn how CPUs run commands what's actually going on under the hood. And again, it's like with architecture, you start writing, you, you write better C++ code when you understand what's actually happening underneath the hood. And it's very common. Like if you, if you go to Reddit and you go to like their uh, uh, CPP questions, CPP questions and, yeah, okay, you just go to question like this. What you will see is that, exactly. Go to Godbolt and find out. So Godbolt is Compiler Explorer, and Godbolt will show you the assembly code generated by your C++ code. Extremely common, extremely common response on uh, Reddit or any sort of time you're dealing with experts is people are like, what's faster? Should I use option A or option B? And the answers you will get are either benchmark it yourself or put it on Godbolt and see what the assembly says, you know? And so if you understand assembly, you can read this and be like, oh, okay, I see what's going on here. Uh, I personally like ARM32, so um, trunk, okay. And then, you know, I'd look at this and it's optimized. Let's turn the optimization level up a little bit. Yeah. And then you can look at this and see what kind of code is generated and see which of the two options are faster. Is is this option faster? Is this option faster? You can look at it and uh, look at the assembly that it makes. All right, you can see if the optimizer is picking up different tricks and things like that. So that's, you know, even if you don't write code in assembly, it's extremely common for experienced people to be like, look at the assembly generated by your code and see if it's any good. So you don't write it, but you gotta read it, you know, and, and know enough about it and know enough what's happening there. So when you look at it, you're like, oh yeah, my C++ code is not good. I need to fix that. And then you look at it and like, okay, good. It's not, it's not wasting time or whatever. So uh, assembly is really fun. Uh, it's not hard. Uh, you do assembly, you learn architecture, you learn projects. And you know, even if you never write code in assembly for the rest of your life, you still have a good solid understanding of how the CPU works after taking that class. And that just makes you a better programmer overall. Then finally, we've got uh, not part of the main sequence. We've got IS50A and IS50B. So IS50A is intro to game dev. It is playing games, it is analyzing games, and it is Unreal Engine 5 with blueprints coding. So you learn how to make a game. And blueprints, blueprints kind of looks like Scratch. Um, It's like a visual way of coding. Megan, what's, what are your thoughts on, on blueprints? So you got, you got like connect things like Tinker Toys kind of together. I like them, I like them too. Um, sometimes you can end up getting spaghetti, you know, where it's kind of hard to see what's going on. But um, 
lot, most of my functions are about this complicated. So begin play, it delays for three seconds, branch, if the integer plus 100 is over 50, then do this, otherwise do this. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Most of my code's about that complicated. And so it's not that hard to follow. You can, like that's an if statement right there, right? A branch is an if statement. And that's a variable, and that's addition, that's comparison, and that's a delay, which you sleep in C++. And so it, it, it's it's good programming experience. Like even if you're even if you're not a um, gamer or whatever, um, I think it's worth it to take IS fifty eight. Uh, some of my blooper code is super spaghetti, but I mean, hey, it still works. Gives you a good sense of code flow. They're easy to use. Yeah, and, and also like looking at it visually can kind of like exercise your brain in different ways. And the colors are like types, and so when you Look at something and kind of see the type system in, in action when you connect something and it does the casting operator for you and like it, it like it actually kind of makes you think about code in a different way i really like it and then this is a uh, uh, intermediate game dev and this is mostly c plus plus with also so we do more advanced unreal engine 5 stuff and we also do a lot of c plus plus coding it's a it's a, about csi 26 level coding but I also tailor it to the people in the class every semester. So every semester of 50B is different. Um, the best time to, to take 50 and 50B is probably in the summer, in my opinion. Uh, I, 50B is worse, way worse. It's, it's a lot harder. It is. But also, I made it hard for Meg, just because uh, she and Voss and Raymond um, were, uh, you know, some of the, the best uh, students I've had. So I, I kind of like turned the difficulty up a little bit for him. But uh, can you take it at any point after? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, <laughs> this is Megan's reaction on uh, <laughs> it, it could be as easy or as hard as as the capability of the students are. So uh, you can take you can take 50 B, you can take 50A at any point. 50A doesn't require any programming knowledge at all. 50B, I recommend you take it after 41. So I think the best time to take game dev is over the summer. So in July, it's three hours a day, three and a half hours a day. You come in at noon, you code till 3.30. But we mix it up. We play games, we play board games, we analyze and talk about game mechanics, things like that. And uh, the 50B people, uh, depending on their individual skills, I either give them Things from like making new materials in Unreal Engine to coding these things in, in C++ that are at about 26. Some of them are CSI 41 assignments. Some of them are CSI 26 assignments. And I kind of, I'll actually switch assignments from 50B into 41 and 26. So, for example, uh, one of Megan's favorite assignments was called SPF2. Uh, SPF2, no, no, no. SPF2, lowercase C. Uh, Kearney, it's really fun. Also, Kearney, imported this library using this 912-step tutorial and then create a working game engine from scratch with no documentation. Go. But I believe in you guys. All right. So if I make a 30 by 30 zone and I will make a asteroid at location 2828, I'll make a rectangle going from 5.5 five to 10.10. 10. I'll make a circle at... 2020 with a radius of five. Then what we get here, so you can see that that's the rectangle over there. There's the circle. In the very bottom right corner at 2028, we got an asteroid. Okay. So what we have here, all jokes aside, I'm better for it. Good. Thank you for that, Megan. Um, so what we have here is something called a sine distance field. And this actually was one of the warm-up assignments for CSI 41. And I, I kind of go back and forth between it. 50, 50B41, because this is used in games programming a lot. Counter-Strike uses it in several different ways. Um, like if you have a line like an O in your in your font, it can actually thicken the font line by saying, all right, all the ones on here are also drawn on the font. So it can make the font, the font thicker and bolder uh, based on, you know, if it thinks it needs more visibility or not. But what the, uh, what the sign distance field is used for like, let's say you're standing here and you shoot a gun. And you want to know, did I hit something? 
Like there's a box over here that you could hit. There is a uh, circle over here you can hit. There's an asteroid you can hit. So you're standing here and you shoot your gun. And you're shooting it in the northeast direction. When you have a sign distance field, that's telling you at every point in the world how close you are to the nearest object. It doesn't tell you which direction the object's in. It just tells you how close the nearest object is. And so if you shoot your gun in the northeast direction, you know there are no obstacles between you and the point one, two, three, four, five, six, that way. And so you can just jump to that square and be like, how close am I to the nearest thing? And it's like six away. I'm like, all right, cool, six again, all right. And it goes one, two, three, four, five, six. And then this point's probably going to be at 12. Then it goes 12 and it's off the edge of the world and it's done. So it only needed to do one, two, three checks. And it's like, miss. That's it. It didn't have to look at any of the boxes. didn't have to look at any of the spheres. It didn't pull any of that data. It just said, all right, I'm six away. All right, I'm six away. All right, I'm 12 away. Done. Miss. And it, it just registers a miss very, very fast. Okay. Now, if you're going to be hitting something, like if I fire, uh, I don't know, if we're here and we fire northwest, it goes one, two, three, four, and then boom, we hit the, we hit the box, return true. That's where we hit. Uh, and so you know you don't have to check all of the intervening squares because the sign distance field tells you there is nothing within six units of me. It's really nice. And the uh, letters you see here are negative, negative values. So A is negative one, B is negative two, C is negative three. And these are also used for all sorts of really cool, interesting things. We do intersections of volumes and, and things like that. Sign distance fields are used everywhere. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that you might, you might get in 50B. It really depends, again, on your skills. I, I really do tailor the class to the individual students every semester. So if somebody takes it and they're not good at coding, they get, they get different things. Yep. I'll just say I'm better for it, says Megan. None of the people on my team at CSUMB have any idea how to include libraries or set up different developer environments. Yeah, that's one of the things we do in 50B. Like get, you know... Uh, what is it? SDL, you know, get SDL installed, which <laughs> I think would be easy. It's just tutorial chapter zero. <laughs> it's actually the hardest part. It's just getting your development environment set up. <laughs> like, like, here's the web page. It tells you everything you need to do. But if you forget even one step or have one thing out of place, like it just doesn't work. And it's really, really annoying and really uh, frustrating. Uh, most didn't do any in-depth OOP projects. Only one person in my class has experience with GitHub and version control. Nobody's used unit testing like G-Test. Yeah, G-Test, uh, TDD is another thing that I really hammer because GitHub is used everywhere. Everybody uses GitHub these days or, you know, alternatives to it. And, like, you know, I don't want you guys coming out of here having no experience with GitHub. That's why we're doing so many cooperative projects, the RPG project, that kind of stuff. All of them involve you checking in on GitHub and things like that because otherwise what are you going to do? Mail the, like, email, you know, the your source code to each other, Discord, you PM them your code. Here's binary tree dot H. Oh, I have an update. Here's binary tree final dot H. Oh, I updated again. Binary tree final final dot H. You know, and people are like trying to keep track of like, which one's the right one. Well, I updated this one, but then you sent me a new one. Forget about it. Like you just use GitHub, right? And you got to You got to you know, get, everybody hates GitHub. Like, let's, let's be honest. Like, everybody kind of hates Git. Uh, like, it's not great, but it's kind of the de facto standard these days. So, you know, you got to get used to it. You got to get comfortable with it, you know, because it, it does kind of suck uh, in, in various ways. Like, most major companies I know have completely broken their GitHub archives and repos at some point, you know, and had to re redo it. Um but that's, you know, those are some of the skills I try and I'm pushing you guys. Kearney definitely enjoys her struggle. I don't enjoy the struggle, but there's definitely a point. I don't enjoy the struggle. Please. No. I, I want you working hard. I don't want you struggling exactly. I want you, you know, like, like, all right, this is hard, but I can do it. Versus, like, floundering. And, you know, it's like somebody who's swimming the English Channel versus somebody who's in, like, the ocean and drowning. You know what I mean? I'll just swim in, you know, but not, not like, ah, I'm going to die. <laughs> seriously, seriously. Like, I, I want you working hard 
and making progress. I'm not here to torture you or anything like that. And, uh, you know, if 50B turned out to be harder than um, calibrated in part because uh, two of your partners vanished on you. you know? um, yeah, it's not, it's not designed to be like torturous. Okay, so this is this is kind of the the offerings we have here at Clovis. Um, the uh, like I said, IS fifty. I think a great time to take it is over the summer. Just even if you're not a game person, getting that more experience in with um, you know programming is always good for you. And then from here, there's several places where you can go, and uh, they also have intro Java, intro Python, and really, yeah, it's good. Okay, so. Readly has intro Java and intro Python. Um, and then I think FCC does too in the IS department. Um, now, where do you go after? Where do you go after here? So uh, most people are transferring. Most people, some people want to get jobs and that's fine. Um, if you can get a job, more power to you, right? Um, but most people I think are transferring and, uh, the most common transfer destinations are the CSU and the UC systems. Okay. So the CSU has like two main places where my students go to from here. And that is CSU Fresno State where I teach also. And there's CSU Monterey Bay. And Fresno State is obviously here in Fresno, which is a big selling point to a lot of students. It's the only... You know, I guess there's Fresno. I guess there's Fresno Pacific also. I'll put that on there. FPU uh, kind of has a software engineering degree completion program for you guys. Um, but Fresno State's kind of like a go-to. Like if you want to get your four-year degree in computer science, uh, uh, that's kind of the default location where a lot of students go. That's where Mancrelli is going, and um, a lot of students want to stay in Fresno. They don't want to leave to go to Berkeley or something like that. So. Fresno State's here. Uh, the, the department's really been working on uh, getting, like improving itself, hiring, like great new faculty, stuff like that. Um, you guys should be pretty well situated for Fresno State. For example, you know, I, I teach you guys hash tables and things like that. And when you take junior level data structures at Fresno State and at UCSD and things like that, a lot of schools have hash tables be a junior level topic, which I don't know. I think it's important enough to teach as a freshman. But uh, you guys are going to be pretty well situated, kind of no matter where you go. Uh, so Monterey Bay has both online and in person. So uh, Megan just said, so far the online professors at CSUMB have been cool and accessible. So uh, Andrew Bell uh, went there. Let's see if I can summon him uh, on Discord. Um, Bell went there, uh, the pandemic started four years ago, uh, and, uh, he, he went to CCMB, graduated, he's been working as a, um, software engineer in Texas ever since, done quite well for himself. Um, Bedencourt, who you might have seen on the memes channel here, he's at Monterey Bay in person. So he actually moved there and is taking the classes there. Now, one of the things that I really like about Monterey Bay is that you only take one class at a time, Megan, is that correct? Like you take one course. And that was something that I really noticed after I graduated from college and I went back to college because I like learning and I like taking classes because I'm a nerd, uh, was it was a lot easier for me when you only have one class. So even though I was working full time, even though I was working four jobs, I was working four jobs, I was teaching at Clovis. I was teaching at Fresno State. I have my own business. And I was teaching martial arts, technically. Um, I decided I would take Japanese too. And it was still easier taking Japanese, even though it was an incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult class. Um, it was still a lot easier for me to focus on that class, even with four jobs, because I only had one class. Whereas when I was in college, it was constantly the juggling, this juggling effort where like you're in calculus and you're in physics and you're in two computer science classes. And it's like, all right, what do I prioritize more? Do I prioritize 
this or that. And then you start doing the homework and you're like, oh, shoot, this is a lot harder than I thought it would be. And in juggling all that stuff and, and mentally, you're kind of like bouncing between different topics in your head all the time. And when you only take one class at a time, like that's it. Like every day I had my cell phone, you know, I've got my flashcards on there. And I'm like, boom, let's do some vote. I'm at lunch. I'm just flash carding myself on uh, Japanese, like vocab, 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 all the words. Every day at lunch, I had my textbook with me that I'd read. And I could really focus on it. Even though I worked a lot, you know, there's still time in the day, you know, lunch, dinner, whatever, when you got some downtime, to just practice and review on it. I did much, much better in uh, Mandarin and, and Japanese, even though I'm not a language person at all. That's why I'm taking all these languages. Because I'm terrible at it. Um, because it's just one class at a time. And so that's something I really like about CCMP. All right, see you, Megan. Um, there are two times through the program where you take like two at a time, but they intentionally make it so when that happens, one of them is an upper div G. Okay, yeah. So basically, most of the time at CCMP, you're taking one class at a time, which is nice. Then the uh, UCs, uh, there's some good options for UCs as well. Uh, Berkeley, I think, is... Uh, which they just called Cal, is, you know, it's kind of like the number one computer science in the world, you know, but it's also tied with five other number ones in the world. So I don't know what number one means anymore when everybody's number one and nobody is. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, Berkeley, like I've had students go to Berkeley, um, quite, quite a number of them go there. Uh, some of them, like, just applied just for the hell of it. Like, they didn't think they'd get in. Well, yeah, I don't know, whatever. And they got in, and then they went there and did well. Um, and one of the nice things about a Berkeley degree is that uh, companies will actively hire from graduating, you know, bachelor students, right? Like, they will go there and be like, hey, you're a Berkeley bachelor. Why don't you work for us for 175000 a year? You know, and they'll, they'll actively, like, recruit you because you're a number one computer science school. So is Stanford, you know, across the bay on the other side. And so is uh, Carnegie Mellon. So is MIT. Like, I don't understand how we have so many number ones, but they're all good, you know. And, and having that Berkeley, uh, you know, name on your diploma looks good. The downside is you have to live in Berkeley. And Berkeley's not a nice place to live. Let's see. Um, the housing situation there is atrocious. The locals hate students and have been actively blocking new student housing from coming in. So students will pack like eight people into one old Victorian house that's leaking and covered in mold. And it's got like one working shower for eight people. Um, high crime rate. And, like if you if you drive around there, like you're like, is wait, this is how expensive is this house? You know, like what? You know, the roads are all potholed up and broken windows and stuff like that. It's it's you know, I, I lived in the Bay Area for four years and, uh, you know, I'd go out to Berkeley sometimes and stuff like that. But like, man, it's just like for, for a place that's that rich and that expensive, like they need to invest in like a new, new layer of paint, like put some asphalt down, you know, when I was there, the, the, the street lights were broken, you know, I was like, do you not have the money to fix the street lights? Like, I don't know how much you guys are making in property taxes. You can fix the streetlights, you know what I mean? So, traffic's terrible. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's an issue. So, like, uh, the, the head of the ACM last year, he actually chose to go to UCLA instead of Berkeley. He visited both. And he was like, mm, yeah, I'm going to UCLA. <laughs> He's just like, I know Berkeley is number one and UCLA is not, but uh, UCLA is pretty good and I don't want to live in Berkeley for two or three years. So, it's, 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 uh, it, the struggle is real. Like I've had a lot of students have that decision over where do I live? UCLA is nice, but uh, limited parking. <laughs> if I have to summarize, if I have to summarize the entire school. It's a nice area. Brimwood is nice, but uh, yeah, parking kind of sucks. Um, and housing is expensive and stuff like that. Um, UCSD is where I went, and. Uh, I really liked best weather in the world, maybe, San Diego. And UC San Diego is in La Jolla, which is 
the nicest part of San Diego, arguably. Maybe Coronado can make a claim to be nicer, but you, you, LA, no, no, LA, La Jolla, like, is really nice. And the trouble with being nice is that it's expensive. And so you're guaranteed minimal amounts of on campus housing. And after that, they're like, have fun, you know? And then you get to play the roulette with uh, your friends. Hopefully, you make friends. And then all of you pack into a two bedroom house where there's two people in each bedroom and two people in the living room. And it's still, you know, crazy expensive. Person's in your closet and converting your closet into a bedroom. So, yeah, UCSD is expensive. I ended up, I lived in La Jolla for a while. Um, and then I was like, yeah, that's, that's a lot of money. And so I ended up moving east to Mira Mesa. Wasn't terribly far. Like when there's no traffic, it was about a 15 minute drive to campus. It wasn't too bad where I lived. Um, the rent was a lot cheaper and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, UCSD though, great, um, great professors, great, um, great school. Just in general, like it's just a really nice campus to walk around and things like that. Um, very spacious. It's a huge campus. Like if you were to price out the price of like real estate in UCSD, like yeah, there's the library there. Brutalism. Uh, if you were to that's the Epstein family. Yeah. Anyway. So, uh, yeah. So this is all like uh, really nice housing right over here. Uh, but like UCSD is like this whole area here. Like it's such a like it, like it is, it is a big, and this is all like canyons and stuff like that. Like it is, it is a big thing. And then there's the extension ish area over here. Like it, it is a large campus. Um, it really is. Um, and then, you know, there's the ocean, right? So you're not, you're not far from the ocean. Um, you know how much these, these houses are. Let's see, Zillow. I just, I, I just have to know. million you know else for sale around here 10 million three point two million five beds four baths three point seven million six beds three point eight million four beds Not bad. You're like on the beach. You know? I wouldn't pay six million for it. It's like you're right, you're right there. Yeah. Yeah, I made nice house. Yeah, so you're you are you are not <laughs> affording anything in the area unless you're like, you know, your last name is Musk or something. So uh yeah, so people typically pile in to these giant apartment complexes that are like on the other side of the five from there and people just wedge in and there's no parking and stuff like that so there's also limited parking at UCSD but it is better than UCLA and then you got all sorts of other UCs there's Santa Barbara and there's UC Santa Cruz and there's UC Riverside and um, Irvine right and all of them have good computer science programs right um, in general though the one criticism I have of all of the UCs, and, uh, you know, I say this as somebody who's a proud alumni of UCSD. I'm a lifetime, you know, member of the Alumni Association. I paid $5,000 for that. Like, I'm not, like, casting shade on any of them, really. But there's a problem, and the problem is their lower division undergraduate computer science classes are huge. Like, 
Berkeley can't seat everybody in their class. And they're already in the biggest theater on campus. Like, so there'll be people sitting in the like courtyard outside with their laptops watching the live stream because there's literally not enough seats in the 500 person theater for everybody in the class. Uh, my, I, like when I TA'd uh, the lower division, like CSI 40 classes and things like that, there would be like, I don't know, 15 TAs. Each one would have, you know, 15 students. And that's not even that large. Like, you know, as far as these things go at some of the other colleges, like you'll have a thousand people in the class. Um, so you have no access to the professor. You have no access to office hours. Um, they don't want to know your name. They don't want to, they don't want you to ask questions. They don't want you to interrupt in, during class. Cause imagine if a thousand people all asked one question, like there would be no ability to get through the material. And so it creates a very different dynamic than when you're at a community college where even the lower division classes are 30 people, you know, right now. And, uh, you know, you've got me right now answering your questions on discord and you can message me at any time. And Nick Corelli does these like, Hey, it's seven o'clock. Come on in. Let's talk about, you know, binary search trees and things like that. Yeah. Like a lot of the professors will just put up their calendar at the beginning of the semester and be like, here are my office hours, book them. And they'll all be booked out by the first day. Which always puzzled me because I was like, well, how do you know when you're going to need help? <laughs> right? Like, I don't know, like a oh, week seven, you know, that's when I'm going to not know the homework. Like, how do you, how do you even know? You know, but it's just people wanting to get FaceTime with their professor because that's the only way. When you have a thousand people in the class, you can't, there's no time for a professor to talk to everybody. You know, They'll, they won't know you. And mostly they do that so that, you know, the professor will like maybe offer them an internship or you know, like a letter of recommendation or spot in their lab or something like that. So it's, yeah, like to me, it's like, I don't understand it. Cause like community colleges, like we don't charge nearly as much as the CSUs and the CSUs charge a little bit less than the UCs, but like the more expensive the college, the bigger the class sizes, which has always been one of those mathematical equations that doesn't make sense to me. It's like, how can we afford, you know, me having 30 people in a class, you know, for a section, and there it's like, nope, we got to have a thousand people in one class. You know, I don't know. The, the mathematics just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, oh, there's also Merced, right? Uh, you see Merced in our backyard, high speed rail is running there, you know, 20, 30, maybe it'll come online. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to the people out there. I've, Kind of became friends with some of the faculty, and uh, they got they got some interesting stuff going on. Merced, they got a drone program that's really cool. Um, if you're into drones, uh, that's that's kind of a really neat thing they have going on. They do game jams. Um, their psych department was working with the computer science department to make psych video games, like don't smoke, you know, kind of stuff. So um, those were options. And then uh, yeah, FPU. Uh, I helped the FPU build their. Uh, Computer science program, so it's a software engineering, which is like computer science, a little less math heavy, and they also do a degree completion program, uh, where if you have two years of community college, they can finish you out uh, with a bachelor's in software engineering in uh, just nine classes over the span of two years, something like that. So uh, that's that's another option for you to take a look at is FPU software engineering program. Um, Simon Sultana, the guy that started it, is now Readly, so, you know, um, I don't know who's in charge of it now, but I helped Simon, you know, a little bit when he was designing the program, help, help him, you know, go out there and have lunch, like, not in any significant fashion, I just go out there and have lunch and talk to him and stuff like that when he was kind of putting the program together. He, he did an immense amount of work getting that, that system set up. So, uh, anyway, what your homework is for today is I want an essay for, from you. So your lab time for today is I want you to tell me where you think you are in your computer science journey, where you're going, where you plan on transferring to, uh, what you're best at right now, what you want to get better at, that kind of stuff. So the questions are all up on Canvas. And uh, I kind of wanted to have this moment. This is usually the point in time um, every year where I kind of like go over the entire set of classes and what they're about and what your 
transfer options are and things like that. Because I always found that always found that to be really really interesting for myself when I was in college. Like, oh, that's a thing. Like, I didn't know that was a thing. Now that I know it's a thing, I can take it. Things like that. So that's it for today, guys. Thanks for coming out. Uh, classes are going to be asynchronous on Wednesday and Friday. I've already posted the videos for them and the quizzes. So I will see you guys not next week, the week after, because next week is spring break. Okay. Peace out. Have a good one.